Welcome everyone. Today is Thursday, April 28th, and this is the Arlington uh, School Committee. Uh, I'm going to be very efficient. I, I think I'm going to get us all out of here in about half an hour. <laughs> um, so the first item of business is to welcome our newest member, Len Carden. Uh, Len could not be here at our last meeting because of a long planned uh, family trip planned before he decided to run. Uh, but welcome, and um, we look forward to negotiating, collaborating, disagreeing, and all the rest. <laughs> Um, so, uh, next item, public participation, is there, okay. Um, so, uh, next item is a uh, discussion about the incremental costs of um, the Gibbs options, the two Gibbs options that we've been considering. This is the sixth grade only or the um, smaller sixth through eighth grade. And uh, Dr. Brody is going to speak to that. Thank you. Um, the committee at the last meeting asked for um, more flushing out of what the incremental cost would be for a sixth grade model or a sixth through eighth grade model. The task force also is very interested in what those incremental costs are, N not between the two models, but, but just basically what would be the incremental cost of, um, of a Gibbs choice versus um, an addition. So I think we're going to have more discussion about this later, but I do want to make some, you know, brief remarks about this um, this process. Really, it was only quite recently in the last couple months that we started looking at incremental costs, though we knew there would be some. Um, certainly, and it's a valid consideration to look at. But I think that in our previous discussions, and will hopefully also be our future discussions. We really do need to look at the choice uh, between the two, not necessarily on the numbers as much as what is the best educational choice. And I know that the committee is thinking in planning for more discussion about this and down the road having a public forum. So it's going to be a process. But uh, we have spent uh, some time on this. Um, I did a first uh, go at incremental costs for the task force a couple, I think about two months ago, really mainly looking at, this, at a sixth grade a as the, um, the window for looking at incremental costs. Since then, we've now taken a look at, uh, looked at those numbers once again, uh, looked at them from a, a sort of a different methodology in, in a way and have, for, have here in this document the findings. Now, the sixth grade numbers, um, just giving you an overview of it, uh, would include um, having four clusters. Now, that would be something of a little bit of an incremental um, increase since currently we have 3.5 clusters for the sixth grade. But our thinking in designing this was to um, increase it to four because it's going to have to go to four anyway. We might as well start um, at a new school at that, at that number of clusters. But also to replicate um, our substantially separate special ed programs. Um, also to look at um, small group instruction for special education, which would include our co-taught program and our inclusion. We would have um, world language, and we would also um, try very hard with all of our specials to have parity with their current programming. So that was looking at the at the at the sixth grade model. We've already talked sort of a ballpark number for that anyway, and it's 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 roughly around seven hundred thousand, seven hundred thirty-nine in this analysis. When we look at the full staffing for grades six through eight. We always knew that this was going to be a, uh, more money just because of the complexity of having three grades and all the specials and making sure that the schedules allowed for um, all the elements of a, of a cluster uh, modeling in a, in a middle school. So again, there would be four clusters, but in this, in this model we would have and this is one of two possible models. We would have a, either a sixth grade cluster, uh, a sixth, seventh grade cluster, a seventh, eighth, or an eighth grade cluster. Now, there could be other combinations of this, but essentially 
we're going to have to have two split clusters. Um, we would have, uh, we would not have substantially separate programming at, at the school. That would remain at the, at the middle school. We would, however, have full staffing for the co-taught programs and the inclusion for special education, full staffing for all specialists, which is actually going to be, uh, require more specialists than the sixth grade model just because um, of the complexity of scheduling this. And uh, we, but we also looked at what would happen if we were to um, look at the possibility of having a little bit tighter scheduling, which, which may impact, probably likely impact, the, um, the, the cluster modeling in terms of having cluster time for teachers to meet about students, which is actually the reason why we have clusters at the middle school. In the first model uh, of, of this, um, with the full staffing, we're really looking at a, a much greater cost of one point, roughly about 1.4 million incremental costs. And if we were to tighten up on the specials, we could reduce that roughly another 200,000, bringing it to 1.2. But as I said, the, th this is something we're going to have more discussion about later on. Um, and while it's, it's another factor in the decision process, I think that um, what we really need to focus on, should the recommendation from the task force be the Gibbs option, then I think there's more discussion and more thinking about all the all of the issues involved in that decision. Uh, Dr. Bodie, those final numbers, is, are those net figures? What I'm asking is, if the, all the sixth grade, if one of the decisions is all sixth grade down here, there's a reduction in the cost for Odyssey. And if six, seven, and eight goes down here, there'd be a different reduction. So what I'm asking is, I, I understand those numbers. Do they take that into consideration? Uh, if I understand your question, does it take into consideration the current staffing? Right. Yes. Well, actually, that, that's the methodology, was taking a look at the current staffing and essentially taking a third to the other school. So but would be an additional cost. These would be additional costs, okay. yes. Thank now, you. if you we had the addition, there would not be incremental costs. There are certainly going to be increased costs. As enrollment grows, these would be over and above what potentially would be the case for enrollment growth. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bodie, can you tell me if the incremental, if when you're looking at the 6 8 model, if you've included an additional allowance for additional staffing given that there's going to be inefficiencies because the cohorts are going to be smaller and the kids don't parse, don't segment themselves necessarily evenly. So to maintain e equitable class sizes at both schools, you may end up having extra teachers at one school or the other. Yes. One of the things uh, that one in our thinking is that we didn't want any surprises down the road. Um, until you re really get into scheduling and, and trying to then prioritize what you want to make sure that is, is going to happen, that students all have a full program, it's very possible that we're going to, this is going to change somewhat. Um, is that what you're asking me? No. Okay. What I'm saying is that we won't know exactly how many sixth grade students, how many seventh grade students we have, and how they'll be split between the two schools until it actually happens. And it will vary from year to year. And to maintain equitable class sizes for the sixth graders who are at Gibbs, if that's what we do, and the sixth graders who are at the Audison and the other grades, we may end up having to add in extra teachers to bring down class sizes in one or the other. You know, it, it, yes. If you have 200 at one and, and 350 at the other, or, it, yeah, do you absolutely. see what I'm saying? Mm. And this is something that we can at least get a handle on sort of the magnitude of what they would be by just coming up with scenarios. You know, let's assume we split the sixth grade 100 in the Gibbs and 300 in the Audison, or I'm, I'm not doing the right numbers, but. You get the idea, and, and let's assume that we do it 150 and 250, and then figuring out what we we need for class you know, 
to do reasonable class sizes? How many teachers would be p would be putting in both places? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, that we aren't going to know. And these are really just a way for us to get a handle on thinking about it. Uh, but I'm saying that we can, we don't know, but we can model it and we can get a sense of how much the difference is for the six through eight model versus the six only. The point I'm trying to make is that I think that the smaller cohorts, if we went to a six, eight at both schools, are going to make for enough inefficiency that there's going to be an additional cost in the hundred to two hundred thousand dollar range to keep class sizes equitable for both schools. In addition to what we have here, is that what you're saying? In it, as a as compared to the six only versus six and seven eight model. There is going. I think the takeaway from this is that one, there's going to be incremental costs. Two that the, the incremental costs for a six or eight are going to be larger um, and we get sort of an idea of the magnitude of it and yes we might have to spend more money in order to make sure class sizes are are fairly even yes right but i'm saying we should be estimating that um, that number also as we go through these I think I, I think we get the sense. I mean, there, I guess there is an open question whether <laughs> there is a difference. But I, I, I think it makes sense to um, ask Dr. Bodie to look at this issue and maybe come because we can't decide it tonight if there are any questions. I, I understand. I'm trying to make sure she understands the question. I'll talk to you more later. But I, there's going to be inefficiencies because the kids won't separate segment themselves evenly, and we need to be yes, modeling what those will cost in mm -hmm. terms of additional teachers there are definitely going to be inefficiencies that's true and as we move uh, this is the first stage of this that we're certainly going to be able to get this a little bit more exact as we go forward but even now when we are budgeting for the next year we sometimes don't know if we're going to need extra teachers until the summertime I mean there's going to be a level of uncertainty uh, uh, all around on this and, and perhaps I'm just not understanding any. No. No. Okay. Maybe we can talk. I, I, yeah, I think it might. Um, Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. So I, I, I think the analysis is 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 very good. As a as as you said, as a rough analysis, it's just I I don't I actually don't think we can get to the level of specificity that uh, Dr. Ampi is asking for. But my one uh, criticism or critique of this is with the cluster teachers. I think what people are looking for is an apples to apples comparison. So if you think that you need four clusters because of the size of the sixth grade in that year in 2018, you're going to need four clusters whether they're at the Gibbs or still at the Audison. So mm -hmm. the idea that you would only have three and a half clusters if we stayed at the Audison, but we would have four clusters because we're going to the Gibbs doesn't make sense to me. So that's the one adjustment I would make. May I make a comment on that? Uh, the, I looked at the McKibben numbers for the next few years, and they stay fairly stable. The year, I, if we were to move in in 18, the numbers aren't that much higher that would require another half cluster. And yes, we could have put a 3.5 in, but we thought that since a couple years out, we would need that other half cluster at the, uh, the, the, the Gibbs School that it probably made sense to have it structured that way from the beginning. And the, it, what it would mean is that we would have smaller class sizes. Now, would there be some equity issues then with the, with the um, would there be equity issues? No, if it was a sixth grade, because there's only one sixth grade. If it's a six, uh, six seven, and eight, maybe. You're creating a you're you're creating a model where only if we go to the Gibbs do we get smaller class size, and that just doesn't make make sense to me. I think we should say we're going to four clusters either way in 2018 for we the fourth. We for could the do that. Grade. We could do that. It's it's a, it's a it would be a decision of the committee to do that. The numbers, if they s remained at the current building, might not justify that in 18. So my question on the analysis is, this assumes uh, 
this is not, this is year, this is an ongoing annual uh, estimate. So you're not assuming that, in, so in year one, you're assuming that we would move, if we had sixth, seventh, and eighth grade at the Gibbs, we would move some sixth grader, some seventh and eighth graders from the Addison to the Gibbs, uh, and we would start right away with the sixth, seventh, and eighth school. That's the point I'm trying to get, trying to make. Yes. Yeah, so we would start with the sixth, seventh, eighth uh, grade school. We have moved some rising seventh graders, some rising eighth graders from the Addison to the Gibbs, and these are the costs under that assumption. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, so cognizant of the time, um, let's move on to superintendent's report. The only thing I, I want to report on tonight is actually how we're doing. This is the first week of the park exam, and I've asked Dr. Chesson if she just would comment uh, on how that's been going. Um, Testing is going um, much smoother, I think, than anyone feared. Um, I, there was certainly some concerns about technology. Um, certainly having a smaller number of students testing at um, Bishop than at Audison made it easier to bring those things under control. Um, but to give you an example, uh, of, at Audison, the first morning, about 40 minutes into testing, I got a text message that said, everything's all set, everybody's testing. Um, the second day, 20 minutes into testing and this morning 10 minutes into testing so every day it gets smoother and smoother teachers get more familiar with um, what are the kinds of things that can make the process as smooth for students um, teachers and uh, staff alike because the technology staff has been in a lot of the classrooms and so are the two instructional technology specialists are reporting that regular education students almost to a student are completing the test well in advance. And I'm not saying that they're rushing, but they feel like they have more than enough time. Um, kids have actually reported, maybe erroneously, but they felt that the test was quite um, doable. Mm -hmm. And um, also uh, students in, in special education, even those students with um, extended time for special education, 504 or ELL needs, most of those students are still finishing within the time window as well. So they're getting that additional time should they need it. Um, so all in all, right now, it looks like a good experience for everybody. Um, I should get to the any questions, but okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so moving on to the consent agenda. All items listed within asterisks are considered to be routine and will be enacted with one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 16156, Total warrant amount, $834,834.21, dated April 14th, 2016. Approval of minutes, approval of draft school committee organizational meeting and regular school committee meeting, April 14th, 2016. All those in favor, sorry. Um, oh, yes, so you wanna pull the um, regular school. Just, just abstain, okay. Um, okay, so uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, and abstentions. Mr. Cardin, um, so it's right. Um, okay, so moving on to the next item, and we'll do this quickly. Um, I wanted to talk to people about the uh, public forum that we're thinking about planning for, to talk about uh, the middle school options if it turns out that we take repurpose Gibbs, which is still up in the air and not decided. Um, I think I've gotten the sense uh, from the administration that the timing that we originally come up with was very ambitious. Very, um, we know that the decision won't have been made until Monday, and we just had break, and it's just maybe not enough time. Um, I've also heard from members of the steering committee of the debt exclusion that they would prefer that we take our time, that we not rush this dis discussion. Um, I think it's very important to reach out to the community, to get community input, to both educate community members about the constraints and issues, and also hear their concerns, hear their thoughts. Um, and so what I'd like to do is suggest postponing that public meeting till, till later in the month. Mr. Hainer. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I have no. I, I accept all the reasons that are going forward, and I think it's good. But I think because we set, we made a statement that we're going to take public input on this issue as soon as possible. We need to have a date for when the committee is going to make the decision, and then work backwards for a date for public 
Uh, I, I don't want this for, uh, just because we're canceling this thir next Thursday, we're not going to have it. Thank you. So the, so the idea would be that we would take the, let's, let's see what, obviously we don't, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but if we're going to be going to the Gibbs and we have a choice between the sixth through eight model and the sixth grade model at the Gibbs, we're going to take that vote after June 14th or before June 14th? That's the question. So, um, so I'd like to make a recommendation for discussion. Um, so what I've heard from the uh, steering committee who are working on the debt exclusion, uh, that it, I think we had thought maybe that if we made a decision earlier, it would be helpful to them. And, and they said to me that they'd actually prefer that we take our time on this and, and, and do as much community outreach as possible. So my current thoughts, but for discussion, are that we should take the vote on the 23rd of June um, and that we should have our public meeting um, the week of uh, the very end of May, 5.30, 5.31, I think. Was the so <laughs> I'm interested in people's thoughts and to, it, you know, see what we hear. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Um, I mean, I, I fear that people, I don't know how we. I don't know. I don't know that we can. We can predict how people are going to react one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think we should specifically schedule it before or after the vote as a result. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that we quite need that much time, given that the presentation on the 14th had all the information from the administration. Hopefully, mm -hmm. parents um, have seen that by now, and and I think we can move forward with a public hearing on this sometime in May, and then decide, you know, when we're ready. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can certainly, I mean, right, we don't have to necessarily make it on the 23rd, but, um, but I think I guess the question before us now is when should we have this public forum? Dr. Alessandri? Do we have to make that decision tonight? Um, because this is the first time the rest of us are hearing this whole thing and, and the first time we've had to talk about it. Could we defer making a decision about this until our next meeting? We can I, defer. I, I, we, right, we can. So we actually I'm voted to have this meeting next week. So, so we need to make a decision to not to defer that meeting. I mean, defer when we're. I'm saying reschedule, but defer the date of the rescheduling until our next meeting. Um, let me think. So our next meeting is on the the twelfth. Um, well, I want to make sure that the the administration has adequate time to prepare something. If we defer the decision, would we? Yeah, Mr. Hanna. Yeah, I'm sorry. The administration, uh, not knocking them, but they should have brought that up last week when we scheduled for next week. We're now looking to have it at least two weeks in, in the future. We're not going to have it on the 12th. We'd be scheduling it on the 12th. So that gives them at least yeah. two additional weeks from what, what sure. we were expecting. Sure. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. I, I think the new piece of information that I wanted to convey to the committee is, um, and this was a surprise to me, that how many people in the steering committee wanted us to, to take our time. Ms. Starks. vote and not for the steering committee but for the decisions that we have to make so how quickly do we if in fact the decision is that we choose to repurpose the Gibbs mm -hmm. how quickly then do we need to have a decision so that we can move forward that's the timeline I think that should drive us not anything else mm -hmm. because what I'm afraid of is putting this off starts to delay everything and I'm not sure what that timeline is. So I'd like to better understand that before we made a choice about this. Dr. Brady, can you comment on this? As I said, we can be ready at any point. One issue is that you, you would want to have the, uh, the teachers come and be part of that forum. And the date you pick may or may not work. I don't know. Um, the f fifth could have worked. Uh, we had, but we can also work on another date. So, uh, no, I, I'm sorry, I, I think your question was when 
would we need to make a decision? What I've heard, and Dr. Ray can correct me if, if, if this is right, is that we, we should make the decision before the end of the, this year, before the summer. Does that sound right? We, that, we, that ideally we, make, we need to make the decision we should, before we should the make summer. The, we should make the decision before the end of the school year, yeah. yes. So it seems like that's our that's I think that, yes, that we should. Now, one of the reasons why, and you can, you'll hear more of it tonight with the presentation, should that be the decision going forward, um, and we, we have the resources through the, through an override to begin the design process, that's going to be happening, and it's going to be important to know which of these options, right. I would not wait until the fall, if that's, right, no. Right. There is no, there is no difference between us making this decision in May or June. That does not hold us up at all. So there's no, whether no. it's June, the last meeting no. in June, the first meeting in June, a meeting in May. In, in terms of the process going forward, no, because we can't move forward with any design unless there are funds for that design. So um, would anybody like to make a motion to, let's see. The May fifth, mm -hmm. and uh, that someone will come up with a schedule, and we will discuss it and vote it at our next school committee meeting. Second. Okay. Okay. Uh, motion to cancel the May fifth meeting um, to come up with a another meeting date at the uh, next school committee meeting, which is on the twelfth of May. Um, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Okay. It's a unanimous vote. Um, no. Motion to adjourn. Is that it? Madam Chair, nope. Point of order. Yes, please. Yes. I'm so, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, all those opposed? No, is that, I'm sorry, what? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Um, we're okay? Okay, so uh, motion to adjourn. I don't know that that is. Made by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, and it's a unanimous vote.